Tunes currently operates in 130 countries, 130, where we can move money from country A to country B instantly and from country B to country C instantly and from C back to A and so forth. Holistically seen, the solution can serve anybody who does an international payment. Um, we focus on remittance companies. We're going to start focusing very hard on payroll providers. This year, we're also going to go into the travel industry. It's, it's a simple transaction. It's $100, $200, $300 that goes from country A to country B. But the compliance in the back is insane. Money becomes more digital in the, ter in the sense that how you are paid, where you receive, right? Specifically in this part of the world, which is still dominated by brick and mortar players. Billions of billions of billions of dollars every year that, that go out of the, the, the country, um, where we believe we can fix a big, a big, I mean, a big problem and bring again efficiencies, do it cheaper and faster. I want to welcome you to the second season of Couchonomics with Arjun. Join us this season as we go beyond fintech and payments and embark on the journey into the future of financial services, a future which will be shaped by existing and new developments in technology and innovation, including and not limited to the likes of embedded finance, open banking, ESG, various versions of metaverse, decentralized finance, digital currencies, and other trends. On the couch, we're going to have the most influential and progressive-minded founders, executives, investors, regulators, innovators, and industry commentators from across the MENA region and beyond. Join us as we unravel a multitude of layers of the financial services industry and try to learn how technology will continue to impact the world that we live in. Couchonomics with Arjun is proud to collaborate with some of the most respected and innovative names in the world of payments, fintech and technology. Ardian is a reliable end-to-end -end payment solution that provides innovation and flexibility to help businesses achieve their ambition faster by turning payments into a strategic growth driver. Get everything you need with Tuyu, a Saudi-based super app for delivery, mobility, on-demand services, and a lot more. Tuyu connects you to everything you need to enrich your daily lives by building an ecosystem across its end consumers, merchants, and reps. Visa is a world leader in digital payments with a mission to connect the world through the most innovative, convenient, reliable, and secure payments network to enable individuals, businesses, and economies to thrive. GDA is a leading fintech and payment solution provider founded in Saudi Arabia, expanding rapidly across the region with established operations in UAE and Egypt. GDA's vision is to empower merchants with the tools to start, manage, and grow their business. M2P pioneers next-gen fintech through innovative offerings across payments, lending, and banking landscapes. Their comprehensive tech stack powers end-to-end -end banking services, BNPL, customized credit cards, prepaid cards, and more. So welcome to today's episode of Couchonomics. I'm your host, Arjun, and today we're going exploring in the world of B2B fintech infrastructure. Um, it's a topic which is uh, of great interest to me, uh, and unfortunately, at least in the region, it doesn't get its due. Uh, I guess it's due in terms of the, the conversation, the commentators talking about it, uh, and us getting enough... Uh, founders, leaders, and executives on the couch talking about it. So today we're going to change it. On this journey today, joining me is Peter D. Calloway. He is the CEO of Tunes and DT1, and he's flown all the way from Singapore. Well, I wish he'd flown all the way from Singapore for this episode. He was here for work, but he's kind enough to actually take out time from his schedule on a Sunday evening and join me in my humble studio uh, and on the couch. Peter, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No, it's a pleasure. And, uh, you know, when I was talking to your regional head, Simon, and he mentioned that you were going to be on town and going to be in town, I said, well, let me seize this opportunity and, and make it happen. So uh, we appreciate it greatly that Super. You know, you've taken out time to come here. So, so, Peter, before we dive in, right, I think um, for, I guess, uh, for everybody, including myself, it would be incredible 
if you could sort of walk us through what is Tunes, what is DT1? There are a number of big businesses which are mm. under this umbrella, right? So, so demystify the business the for us a little bit. Sure, sure. So, so I will add another name to the game. Uh, so the holding, the company above all these companies is a company called Transfer2. Okay. Um, it's a holding from where we hold our investments and we, we manage these, these entities. Um, every company in under here, like Tunes DT1, are standalone companies. So we have in our group uh, multiple organizations who are focused mainly on financial services in emerging markets. Uh, the first one I would like to explain a little bit more about is DT1. Okay. Uh, DT1 is, is, a, is a high level set. It's a, an aggregated platform where we hold everything what is digital values into one, I would say, environment. And you can call via in one API this environment. So think about what is a digital value. What An Amazon voucher is a digital value. A Netflix voucher is a digital value. Uh, one gigabyte of data from a telecom operator. So we have like more than 20,000 um, products in that catalog uh, in 170 countries that you okay. can call. So if you're in the Middle East and you want to sell, for example, um, um, an Amazon voucher or one gigabyte of data from the Philippines, we can deliver that within a second. Excellent. So that's DT1. Okay. Next to DT1, we have a company called Ezra, and that stands for Easy and Rapid Credit. Um, it's, a, it's a buy now, pay later concept, if you want to put it in the form of, uh, of um, the modern fintech, um, but very, very much focused on Africa and Middle East. Okay. And where we're basically going to provide a sort of a loan in the form of an utility. So in the African continent, everything is prepaid, electricity, water is prepaid, TV is prepaid, your phone is prepaid. So if you run out of credit on, 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 on these utilities, we give you a small um, credit in the form of the utility and you pay us back in installments uh, at a later stage. And do you take the credit risk? We partner with banks for okay. balance sheet. We partner with, of course, telecom operators because most of the, the financial service companies in Africa are more the telecom operators. You're right about that. Um, and, and we partner with these organizations. Uh, and depends on the country, regulations are different, license, not license, um, credit, I mean, you need to have balance sheets, etc. So it depends on the country. Um, more important to give some size, we, we have around 20 million unique users, unique individuals per day who ask for a loan. So that's just to give the size. So that's the second company we have. And this is across 170 countries? No, this is in 23 African 20, countries. Sorry, 23 African countries. This is the, the right. lending business. Then we have uh, Tunes, where we basically launched six years ago, incubated Tunes in, in the other company, so it was a spin-off. Um, and Tunes has as a mission to focus basically on, on cross-border payments. As you said in the beginning, um, cross-border payments today runs over correspondent banks and swift rails. Um, it's, we think it works. To that point, it's fine. But we believe it's time to disrupt it and go a little bit faster and, and solve a couple of problems. Uh, and the second problem is in that, in that uh, correspondent banking network, there is a huge amount of the population globally which is not included. So think about wallets, um, mobile money accounts in the emerging markets. So we include that. In so there's a massive financial inclusion Correct. sort Correct. of angle to it. So that's the focus of Tunes, and we have two other activities in Tunes which are linked to this. Okay. Um, so first of all, Tunes wants to move money into an emerging market for somebody. Um, but we can also collect from an emerging market for somebody, okay. so on behalf of an, an e-commerce website and so on. So that's the second one, the students' collections. And the third one is a very important one, is compliance. So we do that under the form of an acquisition with this company called Tukitaki. I love the name. Um, <laughs> it's Bengali for hide and seek, so uh, money launderers and financial crime specialists cannot, they can go and hide, but we will seek them, we will find them. Um, so the, the solution is very simple. Um, it goes into a bank or into a financial service company or a regulated business where we do transaction screening and monitoring in real time. And it, it has as a main purpose to reduce drastically the, 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 I mean, the attempts of money laundry uh, in that specific uh, organization. And, and how many countries is Tukitaki operational um, we, in now? We focus very hard on Southeast Asia. Okay. Um, so that's the, the core um, where the companies, again, we, created and, and started up. Yeah. We have um, headquartered in Singapore. Headquartered in Singapore. We launched um, Middle East about a year and a half ago. And we recently launched uh, Brazil in a bigger size, Latin America. Um, so, so we are now in, in, I would say, Southeast Asia, Middle East, a little bit of Africa from Middle East and, uh, and, uh, and Latin America. So you, they always say you learn something every day. I'm ethnically Indian. Correct. Obviously, my Bengali is no good. No. So, 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 <laughs> Me neither. It's, so, so, uh, so, so I amazing, didn't know hide and seek in yeah. Bengali means Tukitaki. We have two, ama two amazing founders in Tukitaki. Uh, uh, and I, I, I believe and I trust them that it means hide and seek. 
Okay. So so here, here's a question, you know, uh, it's at 100,000 sure. feet view, right? So um, if I look at the last 10 years uh, from the time sort of fintech emerged, mm. right, or the term fintech emerged, a lot of the conversation, a lot of the action, a lot of the uh, investor interest, consumer interest, customer interest was always on sort of B2C fintech, mm. right? Um, B2B fintech and specifically B2B infrastructure in fintech, I felt was always sort of ignored, mm. right? Um, I just wanted to hear your view. Do you, do you agree with that statement? And the second part of my question is, <clears throat> is now the time where for the next sort of five years or let's say the next X years, a lot of the conversation, a lot of the thought, a lot of the mm. money will actually find its way heading towards B2B and yeah. fintech infrastructure. Yeah. I, I um, agree and disagree. Okay. Um, so, so the agreement is probably because of the visibility. Um, I think a B2C company is usually, it's a nice, cool brand. It looks sexy. They're sexy. Everybody <laughs> gets excited about uh, and And it's, I mean, what I just mentioned on, on our landing business, 20 million unique users per day. It's so cool to say yeah. in a B2B, you're already excited if you have really 10 big customers paying your bills. So I, I think it's, it's, it's that excitement and visibility. Um, if, if you would look at companies like like for example um adian um is is somehow is also an they're one of my sponsors by the way it's, it's, it's actually an infrastructure <laughs> player it's a financial company I mean, they do financial services but in behind there is a really cool technology which w- which which they launched more than 10 years ago in the meantime um and and there was a lot of investments in in, in that technology my previous organization was ogon which was the predecessor of the Adian and the Stripes, and we should not have sold it, but it, it, uh, it was back then the right decision to do, um, was also a pure B2B company. It was an e-commerce website who could use us to collect payments from, from, uh, from consumers. We were not sexy. It was always in the back. Um, I was very excited about this, as, and our teams were very excited about And And we, we also got a lot of money for the organization. So I think that B2B play has always been there. It's less cool. It's less, less I mean, visible and less known. Uh, but that's exciting, and, and, and it also attracts a lot of investments. On particular infrastructure of, of payments across borders, um, I believe, and that's what we have been doing in the last years uh, at TUNS, it's, it's more complex, because there you focus, of course, on the correspondent banks and SWIFT, which exist for many, many, many years. Mm-hmm. You have the Visa and the MasterCard, which are the giants in the room, yep. um, and, and they dominate. I mean, if you look on one hand, you can you can see a little bit but it started changing with Alipay, who comes also in the global scale, a little bit of, 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 of global payments. And it's a way harder job to do, building an infrastructure. It, it's like um, building rails in every country and then putting trains on it with something in the train, being mm-hmm. it a passenger or, or goods and so whatever. It's, it's such a big investment. It's time consuming. It's hard. Regulatory is extremely hard if you go cross-border. It's already complex in some countries, but if you then go cross-border... So I believe it's it's just not many people have taken on the challenge to go and crack it. And, and do you think that's going to change? And that's the second half of my question. So do you think going forward, um, um, I, whether it becomes sexy or not, I'm yeah. not here to determine, but are you going to see more focus, more investment, more startups, more talent, more innovation going into B2B infrastructure? I do believe Fintech. so. Yeah, I do believe so. Um, because I personally feel that I think we, we skipped... You know, the fact that we, in a lot of ways, we didn't establish some of what I call the platforms yeah. of making things happen. I, I do believe Adian is an incredible organization. I was actually very fortunate. I, I went down to Amsterdam uh, to to actually interview their, their CCO. Uh, and as a part of that day that I spent there, I actually got into their labs and I got to speak to a number of individuals who were working in the infrastructure. You know, the guys who actually yeah. don't see much sunlight. Yeah. Uh, but it was very, very impressive. Um, I just hope for the sec for the for the sake of the entire sector that we actually see more interest yep. uh, going into it. One thing which became quite obvious to me, uh, and I think you just mentioned to it, was very true: the complexity of B two B fintech infrastructure sometimes makes it hard for people to sort of, I guess, get it. I, I, is that something that you you see changing from a talent perspective? I, I do. I mean, it's a couple of questions you asked now, so I need to structure them. Please, <laughs> in a way, I have um, lots of bad habits. Yeah, I, I, I believe if if you look at um, 
if you look at the ADN example, it's, it's a really cool example because you just type in your cart or your payment method and then poof, the payment happens in the back and, and then your product gets shipped. But it, it's, it's not just that simple in the back. There's mm -hmm. a lot of security, reconciliation. If it comes from overseas, there's some currency exchange involved. I mean, there's a lot of complexities that, that in this case, the agents and, and the other companies in that world touch. So that complexity, and you've been to their office, you've seen there is also innovation in something, I would say, not sexy or boring uh, to be done. And, and that's something which has been, in my point of view, in our industry, in the B2B fintech, I've been seeing quite a while already. Mm -hmm. So it, it's definitely, it attracts, I mean, I can say in, in Singapore, if we say we hire a, we hire an engineer. Yes, there is indeed. Everybody fights for that engineer, and and Facebooks and the Googles, etc. They, they have a really cool name, and everybody knows. And and we are only Tunes. And what is B two B? It's not that sexy. If I tell to my mom I work for Tunes, what do I say? So these challenges we do have. <laughs> but if you explain a little bit what they can work on and what we are doing in the back, it's it's an amazing story, and and we do we, we do see the talent moving in. But it's the same as an investor. The B2C is visible, everybody talks about, um, and, and B2B is a little bit in the back, nobody knows. Yeah, let's not talk yeah. about telling moms. My yeah. mother doesn't still understand what I do. I've been consulting then for your, 20 years. then your pitch is not really good. Well, I, I, but why, why do you think I am on this side of the conversation, Peter? There's a good reason why I sit on this side of, and you're on the couch. Yeah. My pitch yeah. has never been yeah. that good. Now, so, so let's talk about evolution. I'm going to put you on the spot, right? So, you know, you've been in the payment industry. I think you, you, you ran the, the fintech arm of NASPERS, uh, yeah. right? We obviously mentioned... Uh, uh, Hold on. Uh, Ogon, which was, yeah. uh, I think, which is now called Ingenico e-payments. So you've been in the whole payments world for a while, mm. right? So while I'm not asking you to put a crystal ball up mm. there, right? Uh, what's your sort of two or three interesting trends, right? That you see shape the future of, uh, let's call it B2B payments, right? I, I'll, I'll scope it down to B2B payments going forward. Um, I think some numbers out there is, I think the opportunity is about 150 trillion. Mm -hmm. That number is just too big to even comprehend. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's 5X, if it's not 6X of what B2C payments are. So putting you on the spot, two, three trends you believe is going to shape the future of B2B payments going forward. Sure. So if we look at that big number, it, it's, it's mind boggling. That, that's currently running over the correspondent banks. So it's, it's a bank here in the UAE who is connected um, to SWIFT. Um, and they want to wire $10,000 to, let's say, China for a supplier payment. Uh, most likely, that bank has an agreement with another correspondent bank, and then that correspondent bank with another one, and then the money moves. So, so if you see the complexity here, um, and it works, so, so there, is, there is no critics on bad service or whatever, but what you will see is that, first of all, the sending bank here will charge you $10, $15, $20 um, to move that money from here to that other country. Um, and that's because there is so many steps in the, in, in the line that all everybody wants to take a, take a small piece of that. Um, if you then look at the, the, the currency exchange, again, it depends on who the correspondent banks are, there's some steps. So first of all, it's, it's, it's quite expensive. Secondly, depending on the route it takes, it might take between two, three days and, and, and even 10, 15 days yep. before the money arrives. I can fly faster from here with my money to, to Tokyo. Yeah, but, but most likely people are going to catch you on the airport <laughs> 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 because you're importing more than uh, whatever you can import. So so it, th that's the complexity. That, that thing works. It, it works. It does the job and it gets there. But you, you see there's a lot of, a lot of um, I would say, inefficiencies. Let's call it that way. Um, what we believe is that especially for the Bs, not, not the very large businesses who do, I mean, not the very large payments, I mean. Um, we see for the business payments anywhere between $100 all the way up to $50,000, $100,000. These are, are usually smaller businesses or SMEs or even mid-sized businesses who, who, are, who are people who are buying frequently. And these frequent buyings require frequent payments and then you come to, if I need to wait as a supplier 10 days before the money arrives in my bank, and then I'm going to ship the products, I'm again waiting 5, 10 days before, and then customs, etc. it arrives. It's a process of a month, a month and a half before you can, and, and if you don't think, if that amount could be moving instantly, which is I push the button, within 20, 30 minutes the money arrives on the other side, the supplier has now the money, and he has exactly the amount that he's expecting. There's no bank fees that are already deducted on his side. He can reconcile and he can ship the products the day after already, which means you, you, you gain here 30 days of, 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 
of supply, um, I would say, um, um, uh, funding, uh, which is insane, and, and everybody gains here. Um, and, and on top of it, as students, we're going to try to do it as a fraction of the existing cost. Mm -hmm. So, so that's quite innovative. I know it sounds boring. It would have been very no, sexy if I say no. millions of consumers does this and that, yeah. but it's 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 a big innovation. It's it's everybody we talk to in this industry and say like, look, we can we can move your five thousand dollar from here directly into China. And they start thinking, yeah, but then I have my products way faster, or I get the service way quicker, and I can sell it then because they're, they're traders themselves. So that's the first part I think, which which is is kind of um, I would say the, the future in my point of view is that instantness. Pe okay. so people wants to move at money so, like a WhatsApp. So before you go to the next one, I'm gonna have to ask you a question. So the problem statement is very clear, right? Money doesn't move fast enough. It's it's tardy. It's slow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The answer exists. It can be done instantly by tunes, possibly some other players. What's the friction to get people migrating? So the first friction will be who banks currently who owns these customers. So, so that's the first friction. Think about um, an SME or or a, or a mid-sized business. We as students, we are going after the banks. We believe like servicing the bank with our solution, that the bank then can use that solution as an embedded finance um, concept towards their SMEs is what we would like to achieve. Um, if we would need to go in all the countries we operate, in these 130 countries, to all the SMEs, I mean, it, it's, it's an organization of 50 years. So we believe like going to companies who do accounting, who do a lot of small payments, businesses who do a lot of international payments. These are the customers. So we, we, we are very disciplined in choosing what type of customer, what type of partner we go after, uh, just to avoid that we go too wide. The second part is also the complexity of business payments in from one country to the other country it requires a lot of, um, I would say, um, specificities, which come out in, in depends on the country. Uh, think about if you move money to China, in the details of the payment, you need to supply what's, what is it about, what is, what is in the invoice, which products, et cetera, et cetera. Other countries have other requirements. So every country has specifically uh, defined what they want to see, what you need to report uh, for tax reasons, for import reasons, and so on and so mm -hmm. on. So that's the complexity to, to master. And if you see currently SWIFT is a messaging system, which have been doing this and then as you know, in, in, in the supply and, 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 and um, customer environment, or send me the MT103, uh, and then, then I know the payment is on the way, I can ship already the products. So these are the things, the inefficiencies we take out. Okay, so inefficiencies is it. Um, the complexity is the, is the thing. And but, cost. And the cost, right. Second prediction. Again, we, we love emerging markets. So, mm -hmm. so emerging markets today, if you look at the complete market, there is around 2.5, 2.8, depends a little bit who you believe, 3 billion users who use a digital bank mm -hmm. um, in the form of, a, it's a telecom operator who provides a bank account. Mm -hmm. It's an e-commerce player who provides a bank account. Uh, think about in Africa, it's mainly telecom operators. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's Airtel Money and Pedza, um, uh, Orange Money and, and so on. If you go to Southeast Asia, it's going to be e-commerce players. Um, think about Grab, who, who, who has a wallet, and, and so on. Um, and, and what we see is that these wallets, whatever you want to call it, or mobile money accounts, behave as a bank. You yeah, can, so they're an alternative. You can receive money, you yeah. can send money, you can, you can get a loan, you can save some money, you can do some investments. And that's what we call in, in, in the normal thinking a bank. Many of those are SMEs. Mm -hmm. And many of those people, they, 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 they buy daily from, from China, from Turkey, from, from all these countries, their, their, their goods. If we may believe the big consulting firms, which we do because they are very <laughs> smart people, there is, there is a prediction that this is going to grow by 2025 20, yes. to plus 5 billion population. Mm -hmm. 5 billion people, we'll have wallets. consumers, who are going to use their day-to-day -day, um, um, payment tools as a wallet. These wallets today, they're not connected to SWIFT. You, you cannot wire money. And so, so somebody has to take that job on to start building a new SWIFT, if you want, or the new infrastructure, who connects all these wallets to each other to start with, but also connects to the old systems, which are the banking systems, and, and make sure that everybody can talk with everybody. And, and today we are living in a world, in my point of view, 
that almost imagine a world where, where you were a customer from telecom operator A and I'm a customer from telecom operator B and we cannot talk to each other. Mm -hmm. We can only talk within the own telco. It, it's, it's, it's kind of weird now. I mean, it would work. If, <laughs> but it, So somebody had to solve that many years ago that all these telco operators could talk to each other. So mm -hmm. what we see is like the evolution here is one has to connect all these wallets to each other. So there's some interoperability which needs interoperability. to Interoperability. And yeah. secondly, we need to include, of course, the banks in those stories because then you, you basically you have... get the last mile connection. And, and this is where we see the evolution. Again, it's not as sexy of saying hundreds of millions of consumers, but if this, if this is to grow to five plus billion users in, in the next couple of years, that's going to rule the world. So in simple terms, you are going after Swift, at least for a certain size of payments. We go after the amounts that run internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, many over them over Swift, um, but also many that doesn't exist yet today because right. all these wallets they cannot transact. But them they cannot transact. Yeah. There's another reason for it. I, I, I've also realized because I've been dabbling in this world of, of I guess, cross-border payments and wallet-to-wallet -wallet payments. Some of the countries make it incredibly hard, right? I think, if I'm not wrong, one example is India, right? And I think in India you still cannot receive cross-border payments into wallet. Now, it's it's arguably one of the largest corridors and remittances. I'm assuming from a B2B payments perspective also, it would be a very large corridor. Um, so I think regulation needs to catch on. A any views on regulation on this? Are you seeing enough uh, indications from the regulators which sort of makes you feel warm and fuzzy that this is moving in the right direction at, at I guess, the right pace? Sure. So, so we, we as students, we have more than 85 central bank approvals. Okay. And we have through periods of three, four, five months of, uh, of getting an approval all the way up to almost three years to get that approval. Um, so we have seen and we, we, we understand different models. Um, I, I don't have a view on, on why central banks are moving one way or the other. Every country has their own specificities. There is countries who are really aiming and working hard to get money inflow into the country to, 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 get, uh, to get the hard currency in, into the country. Other countries, they, they protect their currency. I mean, it, it's, it's country per country. Um, what I do see is that many regulators are getting really educated about wallets and how it works, and, and that it basically is not a bad thing. It's not a, 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 a bad bank. It's, 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 it's basically banking the population, banking the SMEs, making it all digital, making it visible. As you say, you were just talking like, I can jump in a, in a plane with my suitcase and fly to Tokyo with cash. It still happens a lot. That it, cash yes. today still happens a lot over the borders. So it makes it also electronic all of a sudden and, and you can trace money way better. Uh, it reduces fraud. It reduces com com I mean, uh, money laundry uh, attempts, etc. So, so we do see regulators becoming extremely excited about what we are doing and, and about, about uh, these wallets. Um, but yeah, as every country, some move really fast. Some are a little bit more, I would say, uh, cautious in, in their approach. No, but uh, but I think there's, there's no doubt that there is, you know, as you said, there's a financial inclusion play. There is serving the underserved, I think, which is the SMEs, yep. which in are underserved across the board yep. in every country. It doesn't matter developed, yep. developing uh, or, or any, any other category. Are you correct about, you know, it, it, it stops scams, uh, scandals, uh, all kinds of fraud. Uh, so I think it is the right way forward. I, I, I for me, uh, you know, to be honest with you, some of this does feel a bit unusual, and it does exist in even some of the better established countries, right? For example, uh, um, uh, again, without sort of uh, pointing uh, to a particular country or countries in the region that we're working in, here, you know, we have wage protection systems, WPS programs, which process salaries for people below a certain income. Now, for some reason or the other, that salary cannot go into a person's wallet. Instead, it will go onto someone's prepaid card. To me, it sort of, I, I don't understand why. Mm. I know that there have been a few P2P mm. scandals, mm. right? Obviously, the Chinese one was the big one. And I don't know if that's the reason why mm. people get a bit worried about, you know, you put, keep putting money into the wallets. You, you have this, mm. this ability to create uh, slightly creative products around it. But I do think wallets need to move. So I do agree. So, you know, account to account payments on wallets. Yes, I think mm. that, that'd be incredible innovation. It's already started. I think it's going to accelerate. Uh, I did, uh, you know, I totally agree with you in terms of having an alternative to Swift 
on B2B payments and specifically for payments at a significant mm. price and size for the speed and simplicity. Uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, I know I, I asked you about the predictions, but I'm, I'm mm. going to ask you one other question. When I, or when we talk about embedded finance or mm. specifically embedded payments, what sort of lights up in mm. your mind? What, what sort of, you know, when you th- when you talk embedded payments, what do you, what do you mean by mm. that? Because there's so many use cases. Sure, sure. Right. I, I I I would put it under under um. I mean, if if you look at Adian, which is a company which exists already for many years, it's somehow also embedded finance in my point of view. Yes. Um, you don't see them as a consumer. I mean, sometimes you see the URL or the, the logo, or whatever. But it's it's a it's a it's an embedded finance in a merchant website, if you want. Um, so so I think it's a cool terminology to to park in some some um, um, new concepts that exist. Um, how we look at it as embedded finance. So t- Tunes um, will provide an API to a bank or to a financial institution, um, and that bank or financial institution or financial related business, fintech company, can embed our technology and our financial proposition into their offering. So so now the bank can offer to their customers, which can be consumers or businesses, to move money from country A to country B. And and we are not visible. But in the back, we are doing the the piping. We build the rails from, in this case, UAE, let's say, to Pakistan, UAE to Indonesia, UAE to Philippines. Um, And and that's a sort of embedded finance. Yes. Okay. No. It is, but then let me ask you the other question. Is There's been a lot of conversation on the Scouch in this season that there is a symbiotic relationship between open banking, open finance, and realizing the so-called, again, big number which comes out of um, uh, 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 an individual or a gentleman in the UK, which is sort of roughly, roughly saying that embedded finance is a $3 trillion opportunity. Right. Do you actually see open banking and open finance as an accelerant to your business or it doesn't really matter? For, for tunes, it doesn't really matter. Um, it, it's um, I think open banking or open finance gives a lot of opportunities for specific fintech companies or, or organizations who are domestically focused. Um, I mean, giving access to a bank account, seeing I mean, gives you a possibility to give easy credit because all of a sudden you see all the spendings and the earnings from a person consolidating the bank accounts and, and getting the complete view of somebody. What is his wealth or what is his position? I mean, you can find hundreds of use cases that, that really gets, again, efficiencies, where before you had to fill out a form, you had to give a paper, your salary slip to get a loan and you need to supply. All of a sudden that bank or that financial institution and they click at the button, boof, you get everything what you have done in the last, in the last two years, your earnings, your spendings and so on so it's it it there is a, a big opportunity there um no, without doubt for, for tunes for tunes as such it doesn't change that much um if even in your play even in your propositions that you're actually taking to marketplaces um you mean if a tunes talk into a marketplace where we move money on behalf of marketplace yes. we, we could potentially start providing open banking solutions to these marketplaces but I'm a firm believer of, of we are very good in what we are doing. And if we start to be distracted by too many services, we, we start doing a little bit of everything. Not that great. Okay. So, so, so we focus very specifically on moving money from country A to country B. And that's why I said in the beginning, I don't want to go into, into SMEs. I don't want to go into this. It, it's, there's other businesses who are really, really good to have SME offerings. And I can embed my solution into that offering and partner with them. And, and that SME offering can do SME loans, can do whatever they do with the SMEs, accounting systems, and cross-border payments. Uh, and the cross-border payments is, is the offering that we do. So it's refreshing to hear, right? You've been the first person on the couch this season who's basically saying, you know, great, embedded, sorry, open banking is great, open finance is great. It, you know, it's going to change the world for a lot of people. But, you know, we're, we're okay whether it comes on or not. Right. Yes. Uh, which is which is great because to be honest with you, I think a lot of companies in the U.S. have not had open banking, open yeah. finance. They've used the principles of open banking, open yeah. finance, and and sort of made you know made leapfrogs and Correct. jumps and growth and so on and so forth. But but that's again, I think also because if you see tunes, I can get excited about open banking. But it's just as an organization, the opportunity we are after is 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 is, is insanely big. 
we have so much volume that goes over SWIFT's correspondent banks and the wallets, um, which we believe we can make 10 times more efficient and X times more cheaper. Um, if we start doing other services around, which are all also really cool, I'm not saying that they're not good, that we start f losing our focus on, on, on our, on on our, what you really want, on our really want to do, we, we, we're going to start doing it less good and probably we're going we're gonna to do also a half job on the other side. Okay. So, so we keep on focusing on it. So I think the time is right. I think we, let, let's dive a little bit into tunes and, sure. and ask you a few questions around DT1 and, 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 sure. and, and sort of the wider group, right? So, so uh, first principles, who do you see as customers of tunes? Let primary me, customers. Sure. Let, let, let me then re, re, rephrase what we do. So, so Tunes currently operates in 130 countries, 130, where we can move money from country A to country B instantly and from country B to country C instantly and from C back to A and so forth. So if you take all the options we have, we have around 20,000 options here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's very unlikely that there's going to be a transaction from Fiji Island to Argentina, I mean, as an example. Mm -hmm. um, but technically, we can. So, so it's very normal that the big routes are the ones who are in demand and, and mostly used, but the smaller routes are also there. So, so these are the routes we, are, we have been building over the, over the last um, five, six years. Um, the next step now is like find customers to start putting volume or trans transactions in that route. And then comes the question like, what are the customers? So if I take a particular country A, without mentioning a name, holistically seen, the solution can serve anybody who does an international payment. Okay. Can be a consumer, can be a business, can be whatever, can a government. Can be corporate, can be a bank. Um, as an organization, it's just undoable to go after, all, I mean, 130 countries, in all these 130 countries to go after all. So we had to be very disciplined and, and work what we call our ideal customer profile with ICPs and say, we're going to focus and specialize in these ICPs. And then we can say, the target group becomes smaller and we can focus on it. So ICPs for us, uh, idle customer profiles, are of course banks. I mean, very logic. We have a site, I would say, step there, which are the neobanks, uh, where, we, where we serve uh, an, an, a neobank, who's not always a full-fledged full bank, but they, they serve also consumers, and their consumers, they want to move money in and out of the, of the country. Um, we focus on remittance companies, which is another segment, of course, which pays a lot. Um, we focus on interoperability between the wallets, um, so there, the wallet itself is a customer of us. So moving money from Mpeza to um, Orange Money and so on and so on. We serve um, marketplaces. Um, to think about um, larger marketplaces where there is multiple goods and services provided, um, where the the seller of the marketplace needs to be paid out. Um, and this year, we, I mean, just as another example, we're going to start focusing very hard on payroll providers, mm -hmm. which is maybe not a transaction we think about, but I guess everybody here in the audience, every month at the end of the month, you see a payment coming in, uh, or in the middle of the month, or multiple times per month. Yeah. Um, and, and we see there's a lot of, a lot of I would say, complexities also. How do you pay as a corporate, um, and if you have 20 employees in, in Kenya, 10 employees in Ghana, uh, 30 employees in the Philippines, how do you do the payments? And that runs over, again, the traditional banking system. We think we can solve a lot for these uh, these organizations, um, and then and, and think about disbursements of of, um, of uh, insurance claims is is a large uh, large organization, and then next to that this year we're also going to go into the travel industry. Um, you can compare a little bit with again with uh, with um, with the marketplaces, but if you have a, um, a a large booking engine, the one who needs to receive the payment being the hotel or the or the the, the bed and breakfast you booked or the whatever the, the surfing trip you booked uh, mm -hmm. needs to receive or the diving trip these com this organization needs to receive or the, the safari in Africa needs to receive also the money. And it usually comes from, from the booking engine. So there's, again, a lot of international payments there where there's a lot of hassle on it's costed to send it. The receiver doesn't get always the exact amount and it's another currency. The reconciliation goes wrong. Uh, so, so, and then we get specialized in these segments. We really go deep and we make sure that, I mean, take the example of the remittance yeah. transaction, it's, it's a simple transaction. It's $100, $200, $300 that goes from country A to country B. But the compliance in the back is insane. Um, some countries you need to provide the date of birth. Some countries need to provide the passport number of the sender of the receiver. It has to match. So all that work is, is the work we do in the back. 
and that we that's the reason why we are special and so we we try to focus on these segments that i just mentioned and then we say okay we go to countries where these groups are present of course it's going to be us europe but we focus as hard on china as as hard in the middle east here and then we go very disciplined segment per segment per segment and we try to go deep in the segments so let me let me talk about so, so out of all those segments right I, I, obviously we, we we could spend an hour talking about each sure. segments let's just specifically hone into the money remittance plans mm-hmm. right uh, or the money exchanges or whatever they're called uh, do they do they see you guys as partners do they see the you guys as competitors and and i mean both types of money remittance sure. players right so the brick and mortar players who have all now launched their own digital solutions too but then there are others if i may say the likes of the western unions and the money grants right so who who do you tend to sort of go after and do they really see you guys as competitors or friends or both i hope that they don't see us competitor because we 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 don't offer a remittance product right so so any consumer here in the ue who will contact us he cannot become a customer we right. cannot send money we're not a remittance company we don't have a remittance license we're not in that business yeah but a number of them have actually built remittance as a service yeah. as as a carve out of their own businesses Correct. right because they've built a uh, fairly complex corresponding banking networks Correct. themselves Correct. because so so you're providing an alternative network exactly. to their own so, so, where so we, don't they see you guys as competitors then i i i don't think we compete in the same league then because okay. a remittance company in the UAE who has built their own links to to let's say Pakistan they're not going to offer that to their competitor who is here in the UAE to send money to Pakistan either so it it's everybody's a bit on their own um our offering to to remittance business is very simple we we go to a remittance company we say like look one api one connection one relation we allow you to send to 130 countries instantly So Peter we we spoke about you know you moving money cross border right uh, um you 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 you're working with banks you're working with money remittance companies uh, I, I what I love about this is that there is an element of cooperation but uh, would I be wrong in sort of passing a, a statement such as you could possibly be replacing western union and moneygram possibly we could uh, obviously we're not focused on consumers so, so we don't have the appetite to go after consumers um but more importantly to understand is like as again as students we operate a network uh, and we operate the pipes so western union is is a customer of ours right um and and they're using our our solution to provide to other remittance businesses so by default we already in the back um, powering these payments uh, monogram is a customer of ours um and 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 that's exactly where the the the, the power of the network comes in we we aggregate all these volumes and and we move them into the digital wallets into the bank accounts in, in emerging markets so so by default we have You're complementary we have complement complementary there and 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 that's the, the the nice part is that um by focusing only on network we don't compete on the front side on the with the consumer or the, the remittance players we are providing that service end to end uh delivering the last mile in, into the emerging market i mean and it's a big it's a big customer group of ours a remittance company again one api one connection one relation we give them that complete breadth of a network now what we offer here is we offer the technology we offer the money movement the currency exchange um the compliance aspect um so that these remittance companies can focus on their consumer which is frontal facing being it brick and mortar or digital what we also see is that the wallet concepts again where in the past it was a lot um moving money from here into indonesia and then indonesia they're going to pick the money up and the cash at the cash counter to get a cash out that is something with covid we have seen changing a lot and the money is not sent anymore or not that much anymore to a, a cash pickup point but more to a wallet yes and this was exactly where turns was is and, and and was back then also extremely strong because we have connected all these wallets So so during covid we had many many remittance companies who, who basically saw saw an issue because the sending side was still here and working and getting money but on the receiving, the receiving side, side they were locked up in their house and they couldn't go and get the money from a cash counter so there was a lot of wallets that that that, that all of a sudden were in the mall like can you send the money in my wallet and i can pay the electricity bill i can pay the school bill i can pay the food etc so so we had we had back then in 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 in, in during covid and the lockdowns unique opportunity to capture that and we saw a lot of remittance companies knocking on our door to say hey i want this 
so, so that's the first big element where we bring value is, is to say, we aggregate all that volume, we get way better conditions because we are way bigger than each individual. So it's, it's almost like a group buying, if you want, for the, for the remittance players, mm -hmm. and we give you better conditions. On the other side, which is the receiving side, so if, if you're like a medium-sized remittance company, um, even if you're a big remittance company and you're in the UAE, automatically you're going to send to the traditional countries, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, etc. But there is going to be countries, which are maybe African ones, who are smaller. Think about Ethiopia, think mm -hmm. about Ghana, etc. And, and going to these wallet companies there, these wallet companies are not sitting and waiting on a remittance company who comes with 150, 200 transactions per day. They, they want to see 10,000 transactions per day because else for that wallet company, it doesn't, doesn't make sense to put the effort into it to, to do KYC on, on you as an organization, check your background, etc. So what we see is that, and, and that's a, a recent development with, with, for example, WeChat in China, which is a very big wallet. Yes. They asked us, can you be our front end? Can you be the one who deals with all these remittance companies and knock on our door? And sure we can, because that's exactly the purpose of Tunes, of being that, that man in the middle, making these connections, making sure everybody in compliance with their job, making sure that the contracts and the legalities in the UE, we deal with you as UE. In China, we deal with, uh, with, with a Chinese team and we connect we, we are a translator at interoperability we make again. So that's the strength we bring to these remittance companies. So you guys are sort of, you know, I guess, facilitator as a service. Yeah, uh, you can you know, call it that uh, way. You know, uh, you know at yeah. these days, anything can be as a service. As now, I what is very important in the remittance space, of course, is that it's a very price sensible market, mm -hmm. and, which is logic, because the average transaction is depend on the country, but it's like two, three hundred dollar. So if, if you can save five dollar on two, three hundred dollar, that's three, four, five meals on the other side of the line. Yes. Or it's maybe half a month of school or, or whatever. So, so the price for the end user here is extremely important. And, and that's also, we, we have specific prices per segment. So in, in this segment of smaller amounts, smaller transactions amounts, we will be as economical as possible to make sure that the consumers, the end users here, which are usually the, the blue collar workers, that, that they can send as much as possible from their earnings back home. No, I, th I think it's a fascinating conversation to be had and, and not maybe we don't have the time today because my, my view here is as, uh, as I guess, money becomes more digital in the, ter in the sense that how you are paid, where you receive, right? Specifically in this part of the world, which is still dominated by brick and mortar players, unless these players find a way of carving out the networks that they have built and make these networks available to arguably their competitors, I think they're basically heading straight into a wall, right? Because I think customers will, over a period of time, uh, in large dwarfs, in st large numbers, stop going to these stores, right? If they don't actually have a network which is proprietary to them, then I guess they're left with very little right, except a wallet on the front end. And so therefore there's not much money to be made. I, I personally think some of the big remittance companies will move into, I guess, remittance as a service. And I think it'll move beyond just serving their own need, right? That's just my hypothesis. I could be wrong. Uh, uh, that's my sit. Let me, let me talk about a, a, a question. Now, you, 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 I love the fact that I think about 15 minutes ago you said, you want to focus on what you're very good at, do it excellently well, be the best at it. I'm sorry, I'm paraphrasing sure, you, sure. but that's my takeaway, right? But there is some very interesting developments happening on either side, if I may say, of the of the value mm -hmm. chain of the money, right? Uh, which is which doesn't necessarily require you to become the fintech, right? Mm -hmm. Are you as a business open to partnering with people on either sides, right? I'll give you a very, very simple example. I'm seeing a growth in the number of fintechs talk about remit now, pay later, mm. or send now, pay later, right? Which is basically the bringing together of money remittance with mm. some form of lending, Correct, yeah. right? Whether it's a consumer bank. So as Tunes, you're open to these partnerships or you do feel that that too is a distraction? I would say we are open to the partnership of where the leg comes in of sending the money. Um, Tunes as such, again, we, we focus very much on the infrastructure play, 
to the point again of a remittance company or a business or a corporate or a bank who, who wants to move money. We, we are in the back, we do the plumbing, we yep. make the pipes work. And the more volume it goes to the pipe, the more everybody can profit from it because then, then it becomes economically more interesting, of course. And that's the focus we have. If, if we now go for a particular country, um, and remittances, of course, the biggest countries are Middle East and, and US, etc. We go into, into giving small loans. That's another type of business. Because there, all of a sudden, you face potentially a licensing. You you face. No, but some, I'm not expecting you to give the loan. I'm expecting you to work with someone. who 100 percent. I mean, right. The the one the ones who are moving money from country A to country B is a potential customer. Right. I'm not saying today we will address those because we we are very again idle customer profile focused. Um, but everybody who wants to move money potentially is a customer. Um, okay, us. so let's talk about. I, I read a big press release about tunes and visa right do you want to deconstruct what that relationship that partnership's all about sure um visa has a as a network and it's all public information that i'm yeah, going to yeah. share uh, visa has a network you, you're, you're uh, more than welcome to share with us some secrets <laughs> yeah, too I'm, I'm happy i'm happy to i'm happy to actually share them but i leave uh, that to you <laughs> um visa has a as a network called visa direct yes um, that allows uh, any bank, any any fintech company, any financial service company is connected to Visa Direct to move money from that financial institution to a card or to a bank. Yeah. So it's almost a competitor of Tunes. That's what I was thinking. Right. Yeah. So so that's the, that's the cool part. Um, obviously, it's very much. I like the way you say that's the cool. part. That's the cool part. <laughs> um, the the cool part, of course, is that you can move money from the US instantly into a card of Europe or into a bank of Europe. But then we go in Africa. So there's not that many cards to start with. Mm -hmm. and, and there's also not that many banks to start with. So all of a sudden in Africa, you have 650 million wallets, which are issued by telecom operators. Mm -hmm. and, and these telecom operators, they're not part of that cool network that, that operates. Uh, so, so how do you now move money from the US into a wallet? How do you move money from, from Europe into a wallet? Um, and you're connected to Visa Direct. It doesn't work. So Visa Direct... Um, has recognized what we have built over, over the last years, that moat, that, that uh, wide breadth of all these wallets we have connected. We have more than 100 wallets in our network. Obviously, we start with a subset of that, um, but later this year, we're going to go live with it, which means that every bank, every financial institution that is using Visa Direct will get access now to send money not only to a card or to a bank in a developed country, but also directly into a wallet, wallet in emerging markets. And that's where I say like it's, it's competition but, but they're focusing on segments and markets where we are not that present. I mean, we don't focus on moving money from Europe to US. It's, it's, we think it's, it's big, but it's kind of boring. We like, again, the emerging markets uh, where it's a little bit more complex and a little bit more hard to, to get to get last mile done. And that's exactly what we have developed. Over the last years, we've been working every country. We go to the regulator, regulator approver. Then we get, we get treasury set up. We get bank accounts set up. We get currency trade going. We get connections to all these wallets built. It, it's, it's a massive work, and you cannot replicate this overnight. Not many people have done it, and, and that's where Visa came in. It's like, hey, what you guys have built is exactly what, what uh, I would say enriches our network or completes our network and, and where the partnership comes. We as students, we're also going to work with them mm -hmm. so we can do the opposite way, that all the customers currently using Tunes to move money from wallet to wallet, wallet to bank, that we also can do wallet to cart. Yes. Or bank to cards. And you, you issue your own cards. No. Well, you don't issue your cards, but you do have cards. No. I have a card myself to pay the bills. For the but, <laughs> no, but you move money into cards already. Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. No. So when I, when I read on your website, 2.1 billion cards, what does that mean? Ah, so that's on the collection side. That's on the so, collection so, side. So, so um, we have a solution, which is a network. You can move money from country A to country B. Um, and we can do that from bank to wallet, bank to cart soon with, with a visa agreement also. Okay. And, and uh, wallet to cart and so on. Um, the second activity that we, 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 um, we operate as students is a collection capability, okay. which allows a business to collect money from, from abroad. So think about now a Chinese retailer who is selling um, cups to Indonesia. So that, that these guy cups also did come from China, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Most likely, um, <laughs> no, they did. I ordered them. So, <laughs> so, so, so now, now you have to pay that. Um, so the, the Indonesian 
business who sells these cups, they don't have a credit card. They don't have Alipay. They don't have all these things. They have their local wallet or they have a bank account. So what we will do is on behalf of that, mer that merchant in China, on behalf of them, we're going to create an Indonesian bank account. Again, we partner there. We don't do this ourselves. So we have a partnership with the Indonesian bank. We will create um, cupshop.com, whatever, mm -hmm. a bank account in Indonesia. So now the Chinese customer can say to his, his buyer, his consumer in, in, in Indonesia, just wire me the money on a local bank account domestically. So that, that uh, shop in, in Indonesia goes right. into his online banking, wires $100, whatever it is, $500, into another uh, rupiahs, into another uh, Indonesian bank account. Money arrives, we recognize it, we sweep it, and we move it into China for that retailer. So Excellent. it's a collection service. So okay. here we can collect from bank accounts, we can collect from cards, we can collect from wallets. Obviously, we focus very hard again on the emerging markets. We're not going to compete with Adian. They do this for many, many years. They're extremely good in it. There's plenty of other players in that field. What we want to do is to say, you want to collect money from a Pakistani wallet? We can do that for you. Because there's many Pakistanis who play games. You want to collect money from an Indian consumer who play games, who watch Netflix, who buy. They have their local wallet. Maybe it's just cash that they want to deposit into a bank account. We can collect that for you. Excellent. So that helps That helps me. Correct. Thank you for that. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about sustainability. I was on sure. your website earlier this week and I was reading about it. Uh, I don't want to steal the thunder. I just want to give you the, the opportunity to talk about what is it that you're actually doing sure. in terms of sustainability. Sure. So we, we, we started a while ago with that. So it's something which is close to our heart. Um, I don't think there is a lot of fintech companies thinking about uh, ESG, etc. But yeah, right now they're worried about surviving. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, it's a long debate. Um, so, so we we became ESG compliant a while back. Um, we are certified by Ecovadis, which is a certification authority. They have ten thousands of companies that certify every year. Right. Uh, you get a you get a certificate that you um, you do all these things. But of course, as a service organization, our impact on the planet is is probably myself by flying here um, is probably the most biggest part um, right. we have air conditionings running so we have waste in the office that we, we split uh, we have the computers and the light but, but that's about it we don't produce manufactured things and, and so on um, but still we felt it was important to do for ourselves for our customers and and and, and also very important for our employees because they, they appreciate it a lot um, however we didn't feel it was enough it was just like we can do something more um, and we can do something more. And, and I got that idea from, uh, I'm, I'm mentoring a lot of startups in, 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 in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And there was this really cool young group of, of, of entrepreneurs who, who created basically something which was on blockchain based, but mm -hmm. out of, out of the, no, the normal thing. And everybody talks about their credits and uh, carbon credits and, and the footprint. And if you, if you buy something, then let's offset, etc. What they thought is like, why, what does a service company do? Because I cannot offset, yeah, I can offset my plane, but I mean, it's kind of a little bit washing your hands. Let's buy some, some, <laughs> some, and, and it's, why can't you flip it around and do some proactively? You don't need to calculate, just do something more than, than, than so creating a positive impact, creating sure. a handprint instead of cleaning your footprint, creating a handprint. And that's the name of the company, by the way, handprint. Um, and we did a partnership with them by not only investing the, the team to, to, to create their, uh, their platform bigger and, and wiser, but also in, incubate, I mean, incorporate the offering into our, into our Tunes offering. So, so how does it work? It's very simple. Um, today, if you give $1, about 60% goes to the farmers who plant the tree or, or cleaning a beach, etc. So the guys found like that has to be 95 Okay. So let's reduce drastically that that leakage of all that money that hangs everywhere in, in, in platforms, etc. So that's the first step. So the statement is $1, 90 plus cents ends at the, at the, at the, end, at the end farm. And we're going to make sure that it's also used for what it's supposed to be. So the offering is very simple. You have a blockchain platform, one API, you connect to it, um, and you're going to buy a piece of positive impact. And positive impact can be I plant one tree or I plant one piece of coral or I buy one kilogram of plastic beach cleanup, et cetera, et cetera. So we can create more products. on our, Today we do coral, we do, we do trees, et cetera. As Tunes, what we do is we say, okay, if you stay as an employee at Tunes, you're a Tunster, you join the company, 
we, we're gonna we're gonna commit here a couple of trees. If you stay with us for a certain while, you, you get a package of trees instead of a medal on your desk. Um, and it creates a positive impact. I mean, we don't have to do it. it. There's nothing to clean up here. It's just a positive impact on the plant. Mm -hmm. But the employee gets it as a reward. And there's a cool dashboard. You can see where the trees are planted. You can see the evolution. What, are, what, what is the, what is the, and you have the block, I mean, the block in the blockchain, which is linked to it. So it's yours. You cannot sell the tree 50 times. It's, 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 it's clean. Um, as an example, as students, we put an, as an organization, transactions into action. So we're going to, we're going to commit ourselves to um, so many transactions process, so much volume process to, to create a positive impact. And I think last year we planted over, um, over um, close to half a, half a million trees uh, just by doing this. And, and it's something we keep on committing. Um, and are you bringing your customers into this program? Yes. Is there... Yes. So obviously there comes the entrepreneur again, um, <laughs> which, which is like we do this as an organization because we think it's the right thing to do. Um, but we also invested in the company. We want to make sure these guys become Succeed. successful. Um, so everybody we talk to as a customer, we will, we will um, explain the program because I think you can do a lot. I mean, you can do as an organization, being it in a, in a payments, a bank, um, you can do a lot. Think about um, save so much money in your account and the bank commits to plant so many trees. I mean, I keep on going as the example of trees here. Eh? Um, if, if you're, the trees if, are good. Yeah, if, if, if you're in, in maybe delivering of packages, um, per package delivered, I put a QR code on it, which is one kilogram of plastic on the beach, which I commit to clean up per package you deliver. You can be so creative with this thing, sure. which we believe is, 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 a, is a really cool business concept again. But at the end, it's it's a really good cause because it creates a massive positive impact on the planet. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, I had a guest uh, 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 sitting exactly where you were a few weeks ago, uh, and he talked about, you know, uh, climate change and where we are in the journey. Uh, I, I I actually walked out of this, walked out of that interview literally scared. Uh, you should. With, with, with what we've actually done to the environment. And, and uh uh, and uh, I think everybody should be contributing in whatever little way we can, right? Uh, and it doesn't all need to be in large boardrooms with huge meetings with thousands of people flying in, do all of that. But I think all these things add up and I think more organizations should take a, a you know, page out of your book in terms of what you're doing. So it's very, very credible. Yeah. Last leg of our conversation, sure. right? I, I am cognizant that you have taken a long flight in here, right? Geographic expansion. Uh, obviously, you're in several countries, right? And and like, the one which interests me as a region is MENA. Sure. Right. Um, talk to us a little bit about what's your intent. And I'm not asking you to sh mm -hmm. share your trade secrets or how you're going to succeed and win this market. But uh, what are your plans for MENA? Right. Um, who are some of your marquee customers that you are already working with and collaborating and growing? And, and how do you expect uh, tunes to be, if at all, different in this market in terms of the way it kind of goes to market and, 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 and excites the, the target customers? Because you have a lot of remittances, lots of cross-border payments. Um, a lot of it is still done in fairly, using fairly legacy infrastructure. So I'm sure I'm sorry I've I've loaded lots and lots no, of sure. questions, no, but no, I'll remind you as you go. Yeah, cool. But I think Mina Mina is what yeah. I'm very very keen to hear about. So so by default, if you want to run a cross border business, it, it's kind of international. <laughs> so it's, it's not possible to do it in one country. And if you want to do it global, you 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 have to travel quite a lot and right. and and make sure. So Tunes originally was based on a very decentralized model. Mm -hmm. So we felt like. If you want to be strong in a certain region, certain country, you have to be the locals on the ground. I mean, I'm originally from Belgium. I don't know anything about Middle I East. I won't hold that against you. I, I, and nobody's perfect. <laughs> um, I don't know anything about Middle East. I don't know anything about Singapore. And I, I know a couple of countries and I can get to a certain limit. So, so we decentralize the staff. We have around 430 people, 55 nationalities mm -hmm. in more than 40 locations. Nice. So it's a startup which is truly global, mm -hmm. truly decentralized. Not many companies and truly diversify. Yeah, um, where we do not that good yet is in the female uh, angle. We have around thirty-five percent, 
this should increase and we are working hard. You're on already it. at 35%. 35, yeah. I think that's, that's pretty no, no. impressive, <laughs> this is, right? We are only, only at 35. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, we hire the best candidates always and, and we don't look really like, like with quotas, but it's something financial service technology is, is still a very male-driven environment, but we, we push very hard. But diversification, if you look at nationalities, I don't think many companies of our size can say they have 55 nationalities. Yeah, agreed. And not 35% women either. And we have 55 versions of English. And mine yeah. is the Belgian one, and we have plenty of other ones. <laughs> um, so what we do is we hire, we hire a very, um, I would say, senior person in, in a region, in a, in a cluster of countries, who knows that region inside out. So, so that's, that's for us uh, here in the Middle East is Simon. And he, he's a senior leader. He's here for many, many, many years. He knows all the, okay. the ins and outs, the cultures, what, what, how payments run, and so on and so on. Trust me, he's going to get a 10-question trivia after this session. I will share see. his LinkedIn if yeah. you want and uh, his phone number. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, so, so he, he, he's for me the, the one to go to if I want to understand as a, as a CEO something from this region. Uh, and that's why we have then a little team here who, who is focused on, on, on Middle East. Um, for us, of course, again, this is a region where remittance is, is extremely big. Yes. It's, it's, it's in the top 10. You have multiple countries from this region uh, that sits in the top 10, uh, even in the top three. Yeah. Um, so, so for us, we have to look at those remittances. Um, and in, in that respect, it's also a, an easy win for us because it's exactly what we can do extremely well and where we are really good in. Um, in that in that segment we have for example um, uh, recently announced a deal in, in Saudi Arabia which is a country where we focus very hard on uh, with Bank Al Bilat they have a branch and jazz and um, jazz yes I'm aware and, of them and we're going to power and jazz to move money into the wallets and and, and so forth so so that's that's a, an example of a customer um, if we then look in the B2B payments for example we see a lot of B2B payments going from from this region to China. Mm -hmm. I mean, yourself just ordered the cups. We're not going to talk to the SMEs. So, so we, we are very keen to work with banks and fintech companies who deal with a lot of SMEs and who want to do these payments. Where Again, we, with one API, we will allow them to move money into China. We are one of the only ones who are both connected to Alipay and WeChat Pay mm -hmm. um, and bank accounts on top of it, uh, where we can clear directly in the, in the local currency. And if you see, Chinese and Saudi recently announced a deal that uh, the currency will be... Um, uh, decoupled from the US dollar. So mm -hmm. you see that, that that dynamic, that trait is there. And it's a very important. Um, interoperability, remittance, business payments. Another customer we can mention is, for example, Uredu in Qatar. Yes. Um, who operate, interestingly enough, also a, call it a wallet or a, or a mm -hmm. telco bank or whatever you want well, to call it. Well, every telco in this region is, is rapidly migrating into the financial services Correct. sector. Correct. Yeah. And, and where we come in is we, we are not the company who will operate that wallet, etc. It's not our bread and butter, but where we come in, again, that wallet will have millions of users. These millions of users, like it or not, in the Middle East, there is many migrants from neighboring countries, from faraway countries. Um, yourself, you said Indian background, so you're kind of a migrant. I'm living in Singapore. I'm also a migrant. Um, and and we, we, we wire money home. Even, even I mean... And, and blue collar will wire money home to get food and the bills paid to the schools. Um, myself, I'm wiring money home because I, I still have some some properties that I have sometimes I need to fix something, etc. So so these wires in in Middle East are, are insanely big. It's it's billions of billions of billions of dollars every year that that go out of the the, the country, um, where we believe we can fix a big a big I mean a big problem and bring again efficiencies, do it cheaper and faster. So, so, Peter, just let me ask you. So, you've got a great playbook. You dropped the playbook in this MENA region. Do you do things differently with that playbook? Or you think that playbook just works? We, we, we customize it for the, the region. So, and, so. and so, if I may ask you, and apologies, sure, Simon sure. might be the right person for yeah. asking this, uh, answering this question, but I will ask, what are the couple of nuances that you have seen in the local market out here, right, which have made you localize more than... Um, I guess you expected or anticipated. I, I believe, again, coming to back to the use cases. So think about remittance is a, is a big use case here. Um, so we will focus very hard on, on it's again technical, a couple of items like in the, in the APIs, can we do an account lookup? Um, so if somebody brick and mortar types in an account, um, 
before the money goes out, that account is already checked. It is the right account. It belongs to that recipient. He exists. It's the right. So these are the, the functionalities which we, which we add into that concept. Where, for example, for a remittance company in, in, in the US, it's going to be to Mexico. It's very simple. It's very clean. I mean, it works for many years. So, so these are the, the, the small functionalities which we mix, which we customize for the region. All right. So my last question of the day. Right. And it is, it is, it is actually for an audience of eight to 12 year olds. Oh, okay. Right. I would like you to, I'd like you to explain what is DT1, right? And what problem does it solve or what solution does it provide? So we're fading away from tunes now, eh? Yes. Okay. So. Because I think, cross, because if I was to ask you a question, can you explain what cross-border payments is? Yeah. I think it's, I think in the words itself, cross-border payments, People understand. right? Yeah. So I thought, okay. I thought, let's switch back to DD1 okay. for a okay. bit, right? Um, but you got your audience is an 8 to 12 year sure, old audience, sure, sure. right? Which is pretty much me, so, okay. you know. <laughs> <laughs> so DD1 can be used um, in three examples. I'm going to give three examples, which, which, which makes it visible. Um, and I will start with the example that is probably the most attractive for the, the 8 to 12 years, which is gaming and, and, and so exactly. on. Exactly. So if a gaming company, uh, for example, um, wants to attract a user, um, there is different tools. There is Google advertisement. I mean, all these this things and best. Um, if you go for an emerging markets, that gaming user most likely sits on a mobile phone. Yep. I mean, there's no computer anymore. It's going to be a mobile phone. That mobile phone needs to have a SIM card in it, which is ready to game, which is 4G, 5G, etc. It's extremely costly in emerging markets. I mean, you know, a gigabyte of data costs a lot of money. Um, and to play games, you need the gigabyte. So it's kind of, I'm addicted to a game, but I, I need to pay. So, so what DT1 can do for that gaming company here, not for that end user, but for the gaming company, say like, look, if you want to attract that user, to play a first time or to keep on playing, you can give him a gigabyte of data for free. All right. And we can do that in 170 countries. Okay. So as a gaming company is usually global or multi, multi. So what we do is we go to the gaming company and we say, look, you can reward or incentivize your user by giving one gigabyte of data. If they hit a certain level in the game, if they play whatever, five times and they get points, or if they have loyalty points, they can exchange it. Or if you're a bank and, and, and you, save, uh, you save X amount of money, you get a gigabyte of data as a reward, as an example. Now, that gigabyte of data, I can replace it with a, a voucher from the McDonald's. I can replace it with a, a voucher from Starbucks. I mean, you, you see the, the, the concept here. All the healthy, right? all the healthy food. Think about uh, <laughs> buy, <laughs> buy, buy uh, two boxes of, uh, of Axe de Adoran spray. Right. You put a QR code on it that you can scan, boof, you get a gigabyte of data. So it's incentivization reward right. of, with a digital instrument, which is a, a gigabyte of data. Or, um, now, if you go back to the Middle East here, um, where there's a lot of migrant workers, um, migrant workers, they earn the money here, the, the $50, $100, $200 that they want to send back home to the family. And what you see is that when you send $200 to Pakistan, um, what, what the person back in Pakistan will do is they will pay the bills, they will, they will um, hopefully pay the school, get the medication for the, the grandma, I mean, whatever it has to do. One of the things is recharge the phone because you want to stay connected, right? Mm -hmm. You want to stay uh, connected to the internet or connect. So what we can do with DT1 is, is, is using that same segment I just mentioned as a sort of micro remittance. So, so recharging a phone in India or in Pakistan costs you $1, $2 kind of, but you cannot, you cannot remit $1 because it's going to cost you $5 to remit. So what we allow here, a remittance company in the Middle East, is to say like next to sending money to your family, you can also recharge the phone, the SIM card of your family back home in India or in Pakistan. So now you're at the counter here, you put the $200 at the counter, they're going to be sent over the rails of tunes. Um, next to that, you can also say, like, here is $1, which I want to recharge the mobile phone of my mom, of my uncle, of my sister, and so on. So you've, uh, you've introduced a level of program, programmal, programmality. Yeah, into, it's, into it's the, micro, micro, yeah. micro, I would say, recharge. The fun part is here, it's, of course, the amounts can be $0.20, cents, $0.30, cents, $0.50. Cents. It doesn't need to be $10. Okay. It can go to $10, um, but it creates a certain... So think now about a taxi driver who's having a, a, I mean, 
a good day. And at noon, he has a, a lunch. At lunch, he, he earned his, his first earnings of the day. Instead of, instead of um, I mean, playing a game and, and going have his lunch, he can say, hey, I, I'm going to take my, t- my $1 tip I got there just, and I'm going to give it to my mom directly in her phone so she can play the game or she can call back home. Interesting. Interesting. So that's one. Perfect. And we do this for 170 countries. That's incredible. Peter, thanks a lot for coming in. Thanks for having this, me. This was a master class for me uh, because I've learned a lot. Um, it's, you know, it's a topic I thought I understood, but obviously not, <laughs> not well enough. Um, um, I, I do, I do interact with Simon off and on. Uh, uh, we, we do tend to meet at these, uh, large conferences. Sure. I think you guys are doing an incredible job Thank you. in, in terms of, uh, not just as a business and from what I've heard, but I think, I think establishing a brand and a name in, in this market, I think, uh, over the last 12 to 18 months specifically, uh, I guess, I wouldn't say post COVID because God only knows if you're post COVID or not, but at least in the last 12 to 18 months, I've been actually seeing you guys present quite often. I again would like to thank you for coming in all the way from Singapore. Thanks for uh, having me. We will definitely stay in touch. And if I'm ever back in Singapore, because it's part of the world I miss, I used to actually work there quite often, uh, well, quite regularly because in my previous job, mm. I used to cover Singapore as a market. So I have some fond memories of that. I will definitely give you a call. Happy to invite you into our office and, uh, and have lunch or dinner. And yeah, I was, I, was, I was hoping beyond just sure. the office. Uh, thanks. Uh, you well, can. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you for coming in, right? Yeah, you're and welcome. I really appreciate it. appreciate it. it. So guys, that was um, Tunes, DT1, uh, Peter sharing the world of cross-border payments, remittances, um, uh, uh, and and a lot more we covered. I I hope you find this session as informative as I did. Um, Till the next episode, goodbye and uh, have a good week. Bye-bye.